This series of videos is intended for teachers and, at their discretion, their students. It explains the ways that computers communicate with peripherals and with each other. We'll start with something simple in the first video. How does a computer get a web page? Then, how did we learn to make communication so reliable and accurate? The first video is pitched at years 5 to 6, but is useful for older students who may not have had much experience. This base information can then be used to investigate networks and finally understand how the internet works. The Australian Curriculum Digital Technologies mentions computer communications and networking content descriptions for bands 5 to 6 and band 9 to 10. The achievement standards clarify the depth that the content is to be explored with students. So for a band 5-6 student, the level of knowledge would be appropriate to this scenario. Jeannie is in year 6, she's at home, and she wants to work with Minecraft. She connects her laptop to the wireless, which takes her query, converts it to the numbers that computers understand, and is connected via her internet service provider to the internet and then to the Minecraft server. When Jeannie wants to work with Minecraft at school, it's a little bit different. There are a lot more computers on the network. The connection is made like at home, but the school's network protects its students from inappropriate sites by using a firewall that checks whether the desired site is allowed. Bill is also in Year 6, and his mate, Jono, has told him about a cool website that he wishes to visit, which the firewall disallows. At a Year 6 level, this diagram is probably all you'll need, but some will want to know more, even though it may be more suited to a Band 7-8 or a 9-10 student. So how does this all work? So let's start with our earliest forms of electronic communication, Morse code and then look at how this was adopted to work with the earliest of computers to how we communicate over radio, all of which teach us important lessons about encoding information, making sure it has been received reliably and accurately. It's quite a story. Are you sitting comfortably? Then let's begin with Morse code. Morse code was usually sent over one wire as a series of dots and dashes which were heard by the receiver as clicks or beeps. Because the first communications couldn't send speech, we encoded the letters of the alphabet as dots and dashes. Now these codes weren't picked randomly. You'll notice that the most frequently occurring letters in the English language such as E, I and A have the shortest codes. This improved the speed of the communication. You'll also notice that there's only uppercase letters. There's no distinction between upper and lowercase. Now, Morse code was amazing when it was first introduced. All you needed was a wire between stations and you could communicate almost immediately rather than waiting for a horse-drawn cart or a ship to bring news. In 1872, when the telegraph was connected from England to Australia, using a series of overland and underwater cables, news which used to take three to six months to arrive in Australia by boat took only hours. But Morse code is more complex than it seems. Imagine I want to send AI, so I send a dot followed by a dash for A, then two dots for I, which seems okay. But can you see another way that a dot, a dash, and then two dots can be understood? Has AI been sent, or is it an L? This may not be a very accurate communication method. So, Morse improved this by using timings, as you'll see here. 
Now these timings aren't seconds or tenths of seconds, they all depend on the operator. Now can you see a problem here? A skilled operator would send lots of characters in a short time and beginners would take longer. So receivers would need to listen very carefully to get the rhythm of the sender. This isn't particularly reliable, but it was the best that they had. When computers came on the scene, they first used a thing called a teletype, which is sort of like an electronic typewriter, which were very common at the time, as screens weren't invented yet. The communication with modern day printers is similar as the communications with teletypes was. Letters were printed on the paper by the printhead, which moved from left to right. Today we'd use an inkjet head or something similar. Then the printhead was sent back to the left of the page to start a new line. So as well as letters and numbers and spaces between words, teletypes had to have codes to move the printhead and advance the paper roll. These were called carriage return and line feed. Modern computer keyboards still use a key labelled return to start a new paragraph, but we need two new codes at least to make communications reliable. We need codes for letters, both upper and lower case, spaces, punctuation, numbers and some other characters called control characters to tell the printer what to do. These codes were named ASCII codes, A-S-C-I-I, -I, after the American Standard Code for Information Interchange Committee that designed this system. The word American here is important as the code really only works for the Latin alphabet, which is the alphabet that English uses, and that suited American and other English-speaking countries, or countries that use the alphabet, or near the alphabet, like French. Chinese, Arabic, Cyrillic, and other non-Latin alphabet characters can't be sent using this method. They'll need an extended character set involving more bits of information. This is called Unicode, but the processes with ASCII are essentially the same. It's just simpler because we're dealing with fewer bits. So that's what we'll deal with here. The important thing here is that if one part of a computer system needs to talk to another, they both need to use the same language or code. These character codes are transmitted in binary. 65 in base 10, which is what we use when we're doing arithmetic usually, is 100001 in base 2, or binary. You'll see why we need binary in a minute or so. So let's look at what happens when you press print on your computer. We'll look at a very simple example. Firstly, the computer needs to check that the printer is on, and the printer needs to know to expect a print job. This improves reliability. So two binary codes are used for this. An inquiry, 0000101, and an acknowledgement, 0000110. Once the computer and the printer have acknowledged the connection, which is often referred to as handshaking, then text can be sent. Now in modern printers the text is buffered so that it prints out as a whole line. Modern computers print in colour of course but the process is very similar. If we zoom in on a colour image you can see that it's made up of little bits of light called pixels and if we zoom in further we can see that the coloured block is made of three colours, a red, a green and a blue, each of which has a certain number value from 0 to 255. The combination of three numbers gives us over 16 million different colours, but it's still just numbers and the process is very similar to the printer example. So are we all good? Computer sends text to a printer or even to another device, it's just numbers and all is good, right? Well, not quite. Like our human communication, things can go wrong. What are these communications issues and how are they dealt with? Well, firstly, even if we're attentive, we sometimes have difficulty in hearing what's being said. We confuse words. 
Secondarily, like people in a room, devices connected to a local area network like Wi-Fi can technically all listen to every other message sent by every other device on the network. So we're going to look at this in the next video.